This is Voices of CX podcast, bringing you the most current trends and insights from industry thought leaders and professionals. Our goal is to bring your business into the fourth industrial revolution by sharing the experiences of others who, like you, have dedicated their careers to improving the dialogue between companies and customers. Voices of Customer Experience podcast is brought to you by Worthix, the first and only self-adaptive survey for measuring customer experience. Discover your worth at worthix.com. Sangram Vajri, co-founder and CMO of Terminus, is a passionate marketing geek who loves to solve problems both analytically and creatively. Over the years, Sangram has amassed invaluable experience through his work with startups, consulting, and global companies. Sangram led the marketing team at Pardot through its acquisition by Exact Target and then Salesforce. He's the author of two books, Account-Based Marketing for Dummies and ABM is B2B. He is also the mastermind behind the Flip My Funnel podcast. We're still in season four. Uh, season four. <laughs> season four cool. of Voices of Customer Experience today. I'm joined by Sangram Bajri. Yes. Uh, from Terminus, which is a great company that's right here in Atlanta. Sangram, would you start telling us a little bit about yourself, about what you do, what you're passionate about, how you're trying to change the world? Oh, wow. Yeah. Where do we start? How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's not. Uh, I think... When I started Terminus, so prior to that, I ran marketing at Pardot. Mm -hmm. And I think most people are probably familiar in the world of like Pardot got acquired by Exact Target. And then within six months, Exact Target got acquired by Salesforce for like $2.5 billion or something like that. So I went from this 100 people company, like startup where everybody knows everybody and having tequila shots and all that <laughs> stuff we talked about before, um, and to like this gigantic, iconic brand. Yeah. where everything is like different and big and massive and scale. And I spent about two years, like I made a commitment. I'm going to be here for two years because a lot of people left as they got acquired and you know, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And I learned something along those lines where what scale really means mm -hmm. and what customer experience in many ways means mm -hmm. because Salesforce is very well known for one of the most like yes, really doing really, absolutely. really well and putting customers up front. So that was a really cool experience. And then I uh, started Terminus with two other co-founders uh, like in 2015. Started as just three of us. And now we're about 200 people based in Atlanta and San Francisco. So you guys are a reference in account-based marketing, yeah. right? That's that's the soul of that Terminus, is, that isn't That is it? where we started. That's what we run. And I ended up writing two books, which is so crazy yeah. to think about as part of the, the journey. But yeah, that's, I mean, I remember this uh, this really crazily. At Pardot, we hit every single record when we were running marketing in terms of number of leads. And I remember my sales leader coming in the next day saying, wow, that was fantastic what you did last month. You and your team rocks. We're like, yeah, that's really cool. I'm like getting pumped. <laughs> and he's like, can you generate a thousand more leads next week? <laughs> and I just sank in my seat because I was like, are we like a coin operated lead machine? Yeah, People really. <laughs> think like leads are just coming in, sorry, coming in from everywhere. What, what's going on? And it dawned on me that we're looking at it the wrong way. Mm. We're always trying to put more in the top of the funnel. And we're not asking or talking about, hey, how can we improve the experience so we can actually have better pipeline? Right. Uh, velocity there. How can we expand the deals? How can we do things that will drive business forward as opposed to looking at just top of the funnel? Mm -hmm. So that really was led to Terminus. Mm -hmm. When I heard about account-based marketing, probably 2016, 2016, I would say, I was like, wow, this, so this is customer-centric marketing. Yes, 100%. At least for me, customer-centric, let's call it B2B marketing. Yeah. So when you look at B2B marketing, it, it always, people have the same reaction every time you talk about B2B. Like, oh no, B2B is a different beast. It's all of a sudden like people aren't people anymore yeah. and you're dealing with a company, but you're never dealing with a company. You're always yeah. dealing with people on the yes. other side, yes. right? But one way or another, with account-based marketing, you're able to kind of focus all your efforts on finding companies that are fit for you. Yes. As opposed to just being super duper prolific about it yep. to, and casting a super wide net, yeah. you're sharpshooting instead. Yeah. And you're making sure that the people that do come in have a much higher conversion rate than in other circumstances, right? I mean, ultimately, if you're in B2B, mm -hmm. like, what's the makeup of the audience listening? Is it mostly B2B or B2C? 
time. For us, yeah. for us, we're all B2B. Okay, so if you are in B2B listening to this right now, the good news is that you should know exactly the number of companies that you can serve. And if you don't know that, you need to go to the drawing board and figure that out. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't know that, then you're actually, you're not selling a Nike shoe. The mm-hmm. world is not your customer. Right. Right. Like, you, you know, if you're, let's say, let's just take an example. If you're going after a Fortune 500 financial services company, guess what? There's a Fortune 500 list. So that should be the starting point. <laughs> and then within that, look at all the financial services and then proactively go in front of them and put your message in front of them. That will be way better than creating long form content that somebody might find you on SEO on Google. That's like, why? You know. So how about just go take a digital billboard and be in front of every single company that you want to sell to. Mm-hmm. You'll have a better response rate on it. And you're so right about this whole idea. I, the very first blog that I wrote on this topic, introducing the whole flip map concept mm-hmm. in campus marketing was that this is a customer experience model. I can mm-hmm. actually send you that. That would be it, great. It literally the very first blog. You can blog, link it to the details yeah, on this podcast. It literally said customer experience model, challenge the status quo of B2B marketing and sales. And it was like just I saying, instead of going broad and, and finding a few people that might turn into customer, I think the stat... But Forrester is that less than 1% mm-hmm. of the leads yeah, turn into customers, mm-hmm. which means 99% of what marketing creates is shit. Yeah. yeah. And it's like expensive shit too. It's very expensive, <laughs> right? So instead of that, why don't we just flip it and start focusing on the best fit accounts that you want to go after? And to your point, there's still people, but people in that account. So one of the most common questions I get is that, how do I create alignment with my sales team, for example? I'm like, the reason you don't have alignment is because you're talking about two different things. Mm -hmm. A title of a salesperson is still account executive. Yeah. So they get accounts. And it's not like they're talking to buildings. They're still talking to people. So if you go and talk to your salesperson and say, hey, I want to create experiences for the top 10 accounts that you want to close this month at this quarter, they will be all over it. Mm -hmm. If you give them leads in those 10 accounts that they need to close, they'll be all over it. If you create experiences like direct mail, direct advertising, or content just for that person or that company and create landing pages just for that, it will change the game for you. So a lot of marketers would see that as complicated because you reduce the number of leads. Yeah. Therefore, it should ultimately, like the percentages should be, you know, the same as a large scale. Therefore, ultimately, you get less at the end of the process, but that's not really how it works. I mean, one of the stories in the book is about Thomson Reuters. Mm -hmm. Like, most people have probably heard that as a brand, it's a pretty big multi-billion dollar brand, mm-hmm. right? And their win rate, do you remember what their win rate is? I don't remember. I probably read it like, down just somewhere. Guess it. Like, guess what their win rate is for expansion deals? 26%. Go higher. 53%. Go higher. 72. Go higher. What? Yes. It's 95%. How? And I made sure that their lawyers review it because it's a big company. <laughs> and I, I made sure that the person, Julian Gardner, it was with me on my podcast when we did that, uh, even at the event and stuff. But that's because they knew exactly who they were going after. And they only were going after 250 accounts that they knew that this is where they can serve the best. Mm-hmm. They created messaging for them. So yes, you're right. They have to create more very specific messaging mm-hmm. for them. They created landing pages and content all focused on those accounts. They created direct mail and sales support content all for those 250 accounts, but the winner was 95%. That's amazing. So they didn't need thousands of leads. They didn't actually shut it down. They said, these are 250 accounts we're going to focus on. So if you can go in your organization today and say, we can create a customer experience that's going to drive us 95% win rate, you're going to get promoted. Yeah, right? for sure. <laughs> right? For sure. And, and so it's not the volume gain. And I know it sounds like cliche-ish, like, yeah, it's not quantity it's quality Mm -hmm. but But it really is it really is right i mean it's it's our personal experiences if somebody creates a personalized thing for you you're going to spend time looking at it caring for it and b2b to your point there are still people there are emotions in it so yeah now let me ask you something does does that change the role of the marketer Mm -hmm. to almost a detective or a researcher as opposed to a creator of ads or a creator yeah. of, um, I don't know, strategy, et cetera, yeah. what would you say? Because you have to really do your research. You spend yes. a lot of time researching the market yeah. and then researching the people inside the market that you target yeah. and finding the best way to reach them, I imagine, by exhausting A to B, A, a, B testing. Yeah. I don't know. How would you even... Well, I look at this as the best analogy for all of this is like the classic dating versus marriage. 
when you date, you just don't ask people for like, hey, do you want to marry on the very first date? When you right. Out, right. You freak them out and they will go away. They will, mm-hmm. and nobody gets it. Nobody does that. You put on your best behavior. You do the right things. You do that. And then you take them to the next step and next step and next step. Mm-hmm. Because that's how relationships grow. That's how you build trust. That's how you get to know each other better. Marketing is no different. It's human emotions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the first time you interact with a future customer. And I, you will always see me here don't use the word future customer mm-hmm. as opposed to a prospect. Because who likes to be prospected? Nobody. Who likes to be hunted? Nobody. nobody well, I right? can tell you from experience, nobody. Right. Yeah. But if you believe that because you don't have unlimited number of people to sell to, you only have a few that you can serve if you're in B2B, then you should be treating them as your customers or future customers. Because mm-hmm. at some point, they're going to be your customers. You just have to believe that. And if you do believe that, then you will do things differently for them. Mm-hmm. The first touch point wouldn't be about, hey, do you want to talk and get a demo? It will be like, hey, I'm, I'm known. I know based on the research we have done, we know that you just raised money right mm-hmm. now, funding. So maybe we can be of support to you. Or maybe they just put a new job description for a new role in their company. Mm-hmm. That might make sense for you to trigger like, hey, I can help you with this stuff. Or maybe they wrote an article on LinkedIn or did a podcast and you listen to that and they say, hey, I love that thing. And maybe we can help you with this. So you can find ways to get to them using their own voice. Mm-hmm. And then people respond to you much better. So it is detective. It is all those things. But I think it's no different than any of the relationship mm-hmm. that is worth yeah. pursuing in your life. Yeah. And you'll have more time. Yes. Be, exactly. To sharpshoot because that is the strategy. Yes. So you don't, you don't have to be concerning that. yourself with all the big, huge uh, pay-per-click campaigns because you are targeting individuals, right? 100%. I think the best things I've seen is the biggest change. Uh, I think I mentioned this in the book as well. Companies went from having about a thousand accounts per sales rep, which you can imagine there's no way that person can personalize any kind of conversation with thousand accounts if right. that's what they have in their name to like, like 50 to 100. And when you have 50 to 100 accounts in your name and you say, my quota depends on engaging these 50 to 100, you're going to stop and pause and say, I'm not going to send them just batch and blast emails. Right. I'm going to maybe create a video or maybe do the research, as you, as you said, or maybe do a direct mail, maybe do all these different things that matter to them because I don't I don't get a million chances. I just have this 50 to 100. And that is one of the biggest changes that I've seen companies do. Yeah, I, I talk about this a lot on this podcast because I, I share my personal experiences yeah. all the time. And I'm very, very targeted because of my role. But the interesting thing that I do is I actually read every email. I read every cold LinkedIn approach. Because I'm maybe looking for something that's different, something exciting, something new, something I respect, you know? And when I see that, I'm like, oh, look at that. Like, see, that's a good campaign or that's a good email, you know? And every once in a while, you get it. You know, I had one person send me a personalized video that was slightly creepy. (laughs) What did he say? It was, I don't don't know what it was about it that made it slightly creepy. But it was too a little bit too like on the nail. On your face. Like like a little bit weird. I saw where you were like last <laughs> night at this event. You're I like, saw what you were <laughs> eating for dinner yeah, last night. That would be <laughs> but is so is there a line there as well? Yeah. When it comes to being too personal. It, there of course is. Like you know, you will want to talk about the kids and, and stuff. I think in general, unless the person shares it openly, I think it's like off limits for you. Right. right. So, for example, the job description or a blog or article they connected or wrote about. There is so much content right now that people are putting out there. So yeah. it's, it's no longer like people are not hiding behind desks. People are sharing this information. You just have to be concerned enough to know what that is. And even if they're not sharing, their company sharing. Right. So you can always connect the dots. Uh, one of the examples of one of our customers is that they would look at their 10Ks, the financial statements of the companies Mm -hmm. to look at future investments that the company said that they're going to make next quarter. Mm -hmm. So they will email the CMO that we're trying to sell, they were trying to sell to and say, hey, I know your company objective is to invest in X, Y, and Z. Here's how our company actually can help you save money in that initiative that your CEO said that he was going to invest. So there's no, it's like being so intentional, right? Yeah. Yeah around that. And guess what? A hundred times, like they, hundred percent of the time they're getting response on that. That's wonderful. Still struggling to defend obsolete consumer metrics in front of your executive board? We have a solution. At Worthix, our self-adaptive AI-driven surveys cut straight to the core of what makes or breaks your business. 
While other metrics are a grayscale photo of your customers, Worthix is X-ray vision. See exactly what makes your customers tick and drives your bottom line at worthix.com. Now, some big tools like uh, Sales Navigator on LinkedIn, yeah. they uh, facilitate this a lot, mm. right? They keep track of your leads if they show up on the news. Yeah. They keep track of new articles that your leads produced. Do you think that Sales Navigator is the best tool out there for an ABM marketer? Well, this is really interesting. So I ran marketing at Pardot and mm -hmm. marketing automation has been a huge part of obviously my career, my life. I preached about it uh, before I became ABM oriented person. <laughs> and I recently started to hear more and more people not using marketing automation. They are saying, hey, look, we're just doing email for webinars and newsletters. We can just use Constant Contact or MailChimp or something cheaper, not spend $100,000 on a full blown marketing automation platform. And that actually means that people are saying that these things are not working. Right. Not driving revenue. And we need to create this one on ones. And what they're using instead is a cadence from like sales loft or outreach and using the sales navigator connection and hooks mm -hmm. to say every touch point that we're going to have with our customers or future customers, we're going to make sure that it's personalized from a rep to that person. Mm -hmm. And so you can send them mass emails. Yeah. Like, and so that changes. So Sales Navigator is a, is a good tool. I think a marketing and sales team have to just work together as one team. That's what I was going to say. So like the, the pillar of ABM is that synergy between marketing and sales as if they were a single department, not having that definition of, oh, we're sales over oh, marketing. Yeah. 100%. So it's seamless. Yeah. And in many ways, the reason they're different is because the metrics that they are measured success on are different. Mm -hmm. So if you tell a marketer like, hey, you need to generate 1,000 leads a month, guess what? They're going to go to generate 1,000 leads a month. Right. They'll be crap leads, but, yeah, but sure. They're going to figure it out, figure out a way to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you tell your marketing like, hey, your bonus and everything depends on us hitting a revenue goal, which is actually the case. Like, for example, when was the last time your company had didn't hit revenue goals and marketing got way more budget? It doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen. Right? So it, it's in a way, it's already connected to the head, but mm -hmm. we just take like two seconds to connect that. But if you said, hey, look, your bonus depends on it. And we just need to hit whatever the pipeline number and revenue number is for our company for this quarter, this month, whatever that is. Once you set those guidelines, you don't have to pull them in a room. Mm -hmm. I think people have started to see great SLAs, like service level agreements and stuff between, oh, if you give a lead today, we want you to in five minutes or 10 minutes, otherwise you're manager will get an email or a, a day later your CRO mm -hmm. will get an email. That just means the trust has fallen off so bad yeah. that nothing can save it at any given point. So rather, I would just change the metrics mm -hmm. and say that we need to focus on this is our metric and you need to figure out how you're going to help them achieve that. You'll automatically see marketing sitting with sales. You'll automatically see more meetings between marketing and sales. So I think it's the metrics more so than, than anything else. In this case, if, if you're going to unite those two departments, you need CEO buy-in? 100%. Without okay. that, I think one of the truths I mentioned in the in, in the book, like it started with like seven, one was the value of marketing is defined by sales. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of flack for that. No, I agree. And uh, I think marketing job is to either incrementally or exponentially grow sales. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't know why what, what we do. And that's not. what it's for. Right. Yeah. That doesn't mean you have to like track every single thing. You just have to make sure you're doing intentionally what it means to drive the business forward. And the second one is actually that your CEO has to fully buy into it. Mm -hmm. This is the only thing where you need CEO buying. And one of the reasons is your outcomes, the metrics that you're going to report on are business outcomes. So you would never see a, a typical ABM program should not say, hey, look, how many downloads we got? Hey, right. look, how many people visited our website? It should never say that. It should never go after the, the vanity metrics yeah. that, that marketers like to be like, I, I was always looking at that and saying, right. this is awesome. Nobody cares. Right. The CEO cares about, okay, how many meetings we set for our sales team. Right. That's the business outcome. Everybody would care. So about. where do you think these vanity mark uh, metrics started to begin with? I mean, I did it like for 10 years. I right. would be like the first person to say, and that's because there wasn't that, that was the heyday of marketing. I would mm -hmm. say where marketing was like so high, they're doing all these things. We are getting more tools. And if the business is going good, yeah, whatever marketing, if the business goes bad, that's when the real metrics come out. Right. Right. Like that's when the real questions come out. Yeah. Right? But so majority of the times I think people have been looking at these false metrics. So, so in an example of story in the book is about a company called Pramada. They essentially did ABM for about two years. Okay. 
And after about two years, they were looking at the numbers. And what they saw was that traffic to the website dropped right. by 70%. Now, what's going to happen in your organization if your traffic drops by 70%? Well, in my organization, not much. But in the normal organization, I can imagine it would be pretty Fire. intense. Yeah, pretty oh, intense. Yeah. But the revenue and pipeline numbers were growing. So they're like, the CEO is like, hey, what's going on over here? Mm -hmm. And they looked at it and said, oh, because we're doing ABM, we're only focused on these 500 or so accounts. That's all they care because they're right. big deals. And we only get traffic from these 500 accounts. We mm -hmm. don't get traffic from all the other places we used yeah. to do advertising or whatever they did at that time. So their traffic steadily went down to like lower 70%, but their win rate and their pipeline revenue kept going up. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a classic example of vanity metrics that traffic up and to the right, I always thought that was a great thing, but they proved that no, that's actually a bad thing if you're not going after the right audience. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because even though the way we do marketing here at Worthix, we, we focus very much on the results and we're not so concerned about the vanity metrics. When site access doesn't go up, like so it's not like following an upward trend and it somehow spikes down, we're like, something is terribly wrong, right? right? Something is terribly wrong. And it's really, it, it's really difficult to ignore these yeah. analytics, especially because so much of digital marketing as we know it today is based on analytics. Yes. You know, you sit on your computer, you open up your dashboard, you've got a million different charts in front of you. You know, how, how can you see through all the noise and be like, no way, I've got to focus. I've got to stay set on my goal and accomplish it. That's difficult as well. It takes a, a, it takes gut. Yeah, it takes intentionality. Yeah. And I think there are, it's not just a thing that all the metrics are bad. It's like, what are your primary metrics that you want to set your organization for, right? Mm -hmm. So if you start reporting on, whatever you report on is what people are going to ask questions on. Mm -hmm. So if you state that as a as the truth, then we're like, all right, I'm not going to report on website traffic. I'm going to look at it because I need to know what's going on and what traffic is coming in as a secondary metric. That may be a marketing department internal metric that you're looking at. But with my CEO, my CMO or the executive team or my board, I'm going to look, show them business outcomes because that's what they care about. Mm -hmm. So what conversation you want to drive in your organization is set. The tone is set by the metrics. Mm -hmm. They're so important. Yeah. So if you show traffic month over month, every month, they're going to keep asking questions on traffic. And it's not going to give you either the budget, the, the things that you need. So the metrics should be clearly the ones that they care about so you can get what you want out of it. Mm -hmm. So measure is the final step in your team framework yes. concept. Yes. So you have so you start off with target, yep. then engage, activate, and finally measure. So if we were to break that down a little bit and yep. get into each one, you start off with target. That's focusing on, on the leads that you intentionally picked out with your team. Right. You talk about, um, I'm going to read a quote because it's amazing for me and it was my favorite part. Okay. It says that ABM is customer-centric marketing. It's taking the focus off the metrics you think matter and reaching your customers where they stand by addressing pain points that your team has painstakingly mapped out. So you understand <laughs> every single moment of yeah. friction. Yes. It, that's so customer-centric. Yeah. That's like essentially everything that we are about. Because you're taking into consideration everything that the customer is going to up until the moment that they should meet you and you already understand what their pains are and you already have a solution to yes. that. Yes, you're messaging, right? I mean, at the end of the day, words matter and words has the power to create amazing things. Until you know what the pain is, I think a lot of times the messaging that we create in our marketing function is like, here's our product, here's what we do, here's what we're good at, and here's what we can do for you. And it, to the customer, it sounds like, okay, you're saying you're great. Yeah. Awesome for you. Mm -hmm. As opposed to you just switch that and say that, hey, we understand the challenges it comes with putting together this type of dashboard. Mm -hmm. And we understand that, you know, it requires more than one person to pull this together. Here's how we can help you make it easy. I think just flipping that script changes the conversation. So I feel copywriting, for mm -hmm. example, is so important mm -hmm. in, in marketing. And I feel like all of that is because it has to be customer centric. Right. So I look at our copy all the time. I'm very self-critical about our own uh, website and our own emails that we send out. It's like, all it's, is it saying me, me, me? And hey, I can actually be helpful to you. Or is it saying you, 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 and we can help you with this. It's a really flipping the script complete. Mm -hmm. And then it comes to engaging. Yes. So in the engaging portion, you're, providing these solutions to the pain points. Yeah. 
what is the main way that you suggest reaching out to these leads? Yeah, and that's that's a great question because I think I feel that one of one of the truths is that every account you can treat them as a champagne. Mm-hmm. Either some accounts you have to treat them with champagne or tequila shots, or some accounts you have to do with sparkling water. Right, and that's just the truth. And if you're treating every single account the same way, then you're missing what needs to happen. So, for example, if you're a million dollar deal. You're probably going to do things differently than a fifty thousand dollar deal. Sure. For example, you might go to the location. You might send your executive team. You may have an executive outreach. You may have a customer dinner that you plan for them. Maybe you create an ebook or webinar just for them and and do all these things because that matters to you and them. And this deal is bigger and all the things that go with it. A fifty thousand dealer, you might actually be on a Zoom call and right. try to see if you can close it. So you have to figure out. I think the mistake that I've done a lot is. I would send the same messaging and same conversation in my past experiences to all the customers, no matter if they are the top tier customers or the second or third. And when you do that, in some ways, you feel like you're doing like the right thing by treating all customers the same, but you're actually doing a disservice. Mm -hmm. You're actually not focusing on what matters to that customer because of the size of the deal and the value that they are looking to get out of you. So engagement is 100% dependent on how you perceive the value of the deal is for them and for you. And in terms of how you engage, we had Megan, um, who was one of our SDRs, became an account executive. She did 3,000 one-to-one videos, 3,000 to different personas in the company because she just she was just great on videos. Mm-hmm. Um, Pat, who's our, another AE, he, he's incredible at storytelling. So he writes incredibly beautiful emails that do incredible, like the outreach is amazing. Uh, Lindsay, who's one of our, our inbound sales rep, she would essentially make sure that she looks at, oh, you went to so-and-so school, you went to so so she will always draft up an email and follow up so quick. And she'll get, she sent me an email a couple of days ago saying that she got a response in less, she broke her own record of getting a response in less than 10 minutes. Wow. And uh, it was just just incredible, some of these things. So play to your strength. Mm -hmm. Don't try to do what I've always said our sales team is like, don't try to be like Megan or Sally or Patrick. Like you don't have to do that. Be yourself, whatever God has gifted you with, use those tools, use that strategy and then just do a really good job and be consistent around it. So your engagement might be very different based on what you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. What if we told you there was a way to get all the information you need from your customers in less than 10 questions? Welcome to the Industry 4.0 Survey. Simple, short, adaptive, and meaningful, and guaranteed to leave fewer customers rolling their eyes at the outdated, clunky surveys of yesteryear. Learn more at worthix.com slash AI. Okay, next is activate. Yes. That they're already in the pipeline. It's it's a different thing from accelerate, Correct. right? Okay. Activate, I think this is the part we missed. Mm-hmm. Probably most organization doesn't have it, uh, which is the idea that I got to activate my sales team, not the customer, but my sales team. So, for example, when somebody comes to your website today, most of the time marketing will just give give the lead to the sales team and say, hey, go follow up on this, mm-hmm. right? That's not activation. That's just saying reactive formation of it. As opposed to there are tools right now where you can say, hey, somebody from our target company is on the website and turn this another. There are tons of tools who can help you do that. So before even they fill up the form, you can actually tell your sales team like, hey, you need to start looking at this account. We're seeing more activity from your targeted list of accounts. You only have 50, so better work on prioritization. And then within that, you're helping the sales team craft out. So for example, let's say you have an ebook that's just beautifully well-designed, but it's a generic ebook. And your salesperson's target account is, let's just take the same example of financial services. Then just take the same ebook, turn it into a financial services ebook, Add content that made sense to allow to keep the generic part generic, but the other part you can customize. Mm-hmm. And that can change the game for that yeah. person because now you just customize something. So you really activate your sales team. And once you help your sales team win, even one deal, they'll be all over. They'll be telling everybody. So in the flip my funnel movement, yeah. basically your thing is you turn that around where that bottom of the funnel that's really, really tiny is actually the top. And then instead of being a funnel, it's more like a pipe. It just goes, flows right down. Yeah. But there's also that that whole playbook of the cycle that is cyclical and it's never ending, right? Which is the acquisition, the acceleration, and the expansion. Right. Right? Get into that a little bit for me. So every organization, I've like done, I don't know, like 450 interviews for, for this book. And 
it was very clear that every single organization has primarily three strategies, either acquiring net new business, or you're moving deals faster, or you have more than one product, so you want to upsell or cross-sell. I like mm-hmm. to call it upsurfing them if you okay. have the right product, right? So the whole team framework, the whole stories are around these three, three strategies. Now, most companies are, 90, I would say 90, 95% of the companies are focused on pure acquisition. They miss out 100%. They said, if, if there's an opportunity, salesperson should handle it. Marketing is not, I think that's the worst thing you could do because at that time, you've already spent all this time, money, energy, resources, get over it and actually start helping your sales team. And if you move a little bit of budget and time on the pipeline velocity deals, 1% move in your pipeline can actually mean tens of millions of dollars for yeah. your business. Most companies have like 10, 12% win rate. Imagine if it's 15%, mm-hmm. it changes the equation for your yeah. business. It takes Entirely. the pressure off for your demand gen team mm-hmm. uh, to drive net new reach. So I think if there was any, like the biggest, if there's one thing to take away from all of the conversations is that go fix your pipeline. Mm-hmm. Most companies don't have a demand problem. They actually have a pipeline problem. They have a low win rate, mm-hmm. a really low win rate. And the last part is if you have more than one product, Expansion is the best thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, going back to the Thomson Reuters story, the reason they had 95% win rate is because they understood their customers really well. Mm-hmm. They picked 250 that they knew they, they have a chance of winning and they just went all in with them. And they're like, whoa, this works. There's a movement in the marketing world in general of reevaluating the funnel. Yes. So you have HubSpot, for example, that's got this new concept of like the flywheel, Fly wheel. Yeah. right? So how, how do you think that that kind of matches up? Is it the same movement of people saying, oh, maybe what we were doing before isn't the best thing for this moment? And everybody's just has their own version of how it's switching up to engage today's audience yeah. and today's market. Is that what's happening? Well, it's funny. So Brian and Dermesh, the founders of HubSpot, they're also investors in Terminus. And I remember spending time with them when uh, we went through all of that. And I think what's interesting about Inbound that became a flywheel movement or ABM that's starting to become more of the team framework, these are just evolutionary steps. At one point, we just needed a shock to the system that let's do better. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at just the timeline, 2000, email marketing, people used to get 80, 90% open rate on emails. And this is like 2000, I'm dating myself now. Fast forward five more years, 2005, inbound comes up, like HubSpot, marketing automation, HubSpot, Marketo, Eloqua, all these tools comes up. They said, hey, we can capture leads and we can send emails, fine. Five years later, 2010 comes up, predictive companies come out and they said, marketing is generating too many leads. We can predict which companies we can <laughs> help you sell. So these are all these tools, tools, tools. And then 2015, ABM comes along or Flywheel comes along. It's like, you're still solving the same basic problem. Getting from the right person at the right time, you're in the right channel. And that's why ABM is more of a strategy. And Flywheel is more of a strategy of like, hey, this is a continuous loop of it. Mm -hmm. So I think where we're moving is that tools can do what you want them to do, what you tell them to do. But your strategy has to be much more clear and I think we, in the last 15 years or so, we lost our path a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think we're finding it back like, now. we need to make it customer-centered. So both Flywheel or the team framework or flipping files, customer is right at the center. Of it. Yeah. And we just lost sight of it. Yeah. But that's the amazing part for me because that's where we come in. We're like, oh, hey, the customer centricity works for B2B as well. Yeah. You know, you can't think that just because you're, you don't have direct consumer sales that you don't have to be customer centric. Yes. It's actually the opposite. Yeah. It's, it's maybe even all the more reason to be customer centric. Right? You know, in B2B, you, you actually lose your job if you buy the wrong software. Right. So it's actually way more valuable for you to have that emotional and trust build in that because their job depends on it. Now, if you go buy a watch or something, your wife or husband is not going to like eat out. Right. If you make a mistake, it's like, eh, right. But in this, you'll actually lose your job. So it's actually more connected to the human emotion than I think most people, they look at B2B, I like to call like boring to boring in many organizations. No, it's actually blockbuster to blockbuster, right? Let's right. just make it really, really cool. Yeah. And, and to your point, it's, it's, it's no different. It's humans. Yeah. Now, where does content marketing overlap with ABM? Content is at the heart of ABM. The way I looked at content before ABM was like, let's just create as much content as we can. Right. right? Let's just write three blogs a week two ebooks a month, one webinar a quarter, like, you know, that's typical standard marketing program. 
And what happens in ABM is that you say, look, these are my menu of options. We can do all of these things, but does that matter to the 10 customers that our salesperson is trying to sell to? So a modern organization, a modern content marketer would typically go and say, we can do all of these things, but let's look at what the top 10 accounts need. And if they need us to create a webinar and we only get 10 people on that webinar, then they're the right 10 accounts. Awesome. So I think it's way more valuable. It's way more intensive to your earlier point, but the results are going to be just incredibly more. So it's, it's way more important, but it's not like you can go and hide behind your desk and create content. You have to come out of your shell and say, here's everything I can do. Tell me what's the most important thing we need to do. Yeah. I, I edit our blog as well. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing that I try to be very intentional mm -hmm. over using this word today about, which is making sure that we're not just putting out content to put out content. Yeah. So, oh, you know, today is scheduled blog day. Let's get whatever we have out there. I, I really try not to do that. I, I try to make sure that every single piece of content that we put out is hitting some market. Yeah. Or so, you know, internally, we've mapped out five different markets that we cater to with our content. Okay. There's a really great content marketer who was on this season of the podcast. Actually, mm -hmm. her name is Melanie Diesel. Okay. And she came up with this like content matrix nice. and a way for you to build your content around very specific groups. Right. So we try to do that and we try to create very tailored content to each of these Personas industries. Or, sure. Yeah. But I do understand that maybe one day I'm going to put out a, a, an article that's very relevant to financial services. And then the people who are in healthcare are not going to be engaged at all. So if I'm going to be looking at my numbers in a broad sense where I'm like, oh my gosh, engagement is so low, it'll be frustrating. Yes. And that'll be a big fail of right. an article. But if I open up the metrics and I look into the specific sources and find out exactly the people who did click yes. on that email, on that blog post. And if I did hit my target audience somehow, for me, it's still a win. Boom. Right. So it might not be a, a win in the broad sense, like, oh my gosh, this blog went live and it got 50 views. Yeah. But if the those right 50, people. if they were, they were the right people, then. But how many times do we do that? How many times do you truly, how many times if, if, if like, you know, for you, you may have done this, but imagine I do this all the time on my like LinkedIn post and stuff that I normally put out. I look at who are the people uh, sometimes engaging with it. And sometimes it's so interesting. It's like, oh, this, I would, when I write something, like, this is for a marketer. Sometimes this is for CEOs or sometimes this is for like just my personal. I don't even care if anybody read or not. I just need to get out of my system, right? right? It's so, an opinion piece. It's an opinion piece, right? Like <laughs> sure. I don't even care. I just like, you know, delete it from, the, yeah. from my mind and put it in somewhere else's mind. But you, uh, to your point, you have to be intentional around every single post. Who is it for? Mm -hmm. I call it like the burden of the customer. Yeah. So you, do you have the burden of that one person? I, all, I try to, like, I sometimes I, it sounds kind of crazy, but I'll sometimes close my eyes and like pick, try to picture a person that I'm writing it for. Mm -hmm. And No, that's brilliant. If I do that and I feel like, and what if in, in the comments or response, if I get that kind of person to respond, like if it's a, for a marketer and if a marketer responds, hey, that really was really good. It helped me. My job is done. Yeah. I, I once heard Anne Hanley talk about that where she gave the example of Warren Buffett. And the fact that Warren Buffett has six books published and they're called Letters to Shareholders. Yes. And like, why would anyone want to read the letters to the shareholders? And the truth is that people want to read it because it's actually interesting. Yes. And Buffett himself says that when he was writing the letters to his shareholders, the person that he was picturing in his mind was his sister, who was a grade school teacher. So she was very intelligent, but she wasn't very informed. She wasn't part of the financial market and you know, stock and I don't know what, but she did understand. So when he was writing, he had her in mind that's and that's why it was objective. It was simple. It was clear. It wasn't jargony, Yeah, you know? So picture your customer in mind and write for them. Yeah. And that's what will make your message authentic, yep. relevant, yep. and engaging. Yeah, you wouldn't right? know in men, I got, at least with me, when I write content, I go in like a million different directions. Mm -hmm. I have like 10 calls to action, like mm -hmm. sometimes in my brain. And if you want to get away from all of that, it's just that one person, whoever, Joe, Sally, whoever you want to picture. Mm -hmm. At Pardot, uh, when, we, when I was running marketing there, we actually had a giant human-sized cardboard cutout. 
<laughs> in our office. And that was your persona. That's our persona. <laughs> and we put it everywhere in the office. Like we had like multiple like places in like, you know, it's like what would, what I think I forgot what we call it. I think what we call it, like one was Sam, uh, the sales guy who mm-hmm. was talking to and uh, Megan, the marketing person. So, so it's S and M, and so we would like, what does Sam and Megan uh, think of this mm-hmm. content? Or we would literally talk as we we're talking to them, like, what is it that, what do they care about and stuff? Yeah, so it refer was, to them by name, yeah, right? Yeah, right? Like, so like Sam and Megan, like so Sam and Megan became part of our team in a way. Mm-hmm. So I think it has a lot of depth. It creates a lot of detail that sometimes you just miss out and just trying to get more views. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're out of time for today. <laughs> we did. That was great. What are some ways that our listeners can engage with you or follow your content? You got this book, ABM is B2B, which is out now. And yeah, I was lucky exactly. enough to get a copy of it. So I encourage everyone to buy that and read that. Yeah. How else? What's your main channel for I'm communicating? It's mm-hmm. funny. I'm not, on, I'm not on Snapchat. I'm not on anything else. It's like, I feel like from the last two years, I just made a commitment to post something um, every day okay. I've done it from last two years. And it's, that's the place where I love to engage with people. So if you find me on LinkedIn, just uh, hit me up. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming in today, saying thank I'm really so appreciate it. For awesome. Me. Awesome <laughs> office. Thank you for joining us on one more episode of Voices of CX podcast. This podcast is hosted and produced by Mary Drummond, edited and co-produced by Steve Barry. This podcast was brought to you by Worthix. Discover your worth at worthix.com. Thank you.